Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Dennis Taylor, Star Mutual Insurance Company here in Colorado Springs. Yes, Mr. Taylor. An important client of ours, Mr. Dollar. His name is Melvin Lockerty. Yes? Well, he's spending the summer at one of our nearby guest ranches. And he's having some visitors for a week or so. He's invited them. They'll be his guests. So? A dollar, Mr. Lockerty believes that given half a chance, one of them will try to murder him. Murder him? So if you're free, if you can find the time to come out here... Mr. Taylor, I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Star Mutual Insurance Company, Colorado Springs office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Four's a Crowd matter. Expense account item one. 146.20 for a cab to Bradley Field, a plane to New York, and a jet the rest of the way to Denver. A mile high city in the middle of the most beautiful mountain country I know of. And the home of radio station KLZ. Item two, 7.30 for a ferry plane to Colorado Springs. Taylor was there to meet me. He's a short, stocky, gray-haired man of about 50 who takes himself a bit too seriously in spite of the funny way his glasses keep slipping down his pudgy little nose. I have one of my own cars right over there, Mr. Dollar. If you will drive me back to my office, it's yours for as long as you're here. Good enough, Mr. Taylor. Now, about this man, uh, Lockerty, did you say? Uh, yes, Melvin Lockerty. And he's convinced, Mr. Dollar, that one of these relatives coming to see him wants to murder him. Relatives? Hmm? The only surviving ones he has. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, <clears throat> here we are. Oh, all right. You see, they're the children of his younger brother, Henry died a few weeks ago at the age of 71. Oh, I see. Now, how old is he? Uh, well, according to his policy, 74. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'll point the way to go. Right. And uh, his beneficiaries? Uh, these three who are coming here. Mm -hmm. When? Uh, they're due today. So you'd best get over to the no-name ranch where he's staying just as quickly as possible. Uh, turn here, please. All right. Uh, tell me, uh, how much do you know about these relatives, these heirs of his? Not very much, I'm afraid, outside of their names. Are they crooks or something that he's so scared of them? Hmm. Any crook in that family, it's Lockerty himself. How do you mean? Well, now, how do you think he ever got hold of enough money to afford nearly a half million worth of insurance? <laughs> I'm sure I don't know. Well, then let me tell you. By hornswoggling his brother Henry out of some mining properties over near Cripple Creek. That's how. Oh. Properties that Henry spent a whole lifetime developing to the point where they finally began to uh, pay off. I see. He tricked his brother out of them and then sold them and kept the money himself. A rotten thing to do, Mr. Dollar. And Henry had been a very close friend of mine. This Lockerty sounds like a nice fellow. He's a crook of the first water. And if you ask me, Lockerty was completely responsible for his brother's death. You see, it was by his own hand. And you want me to protect a man like that? I know, I know, but with the company, it's purely a matter of dollars and cents. Personally, I don't care what happens to him. You really hold a grudge against him, don't you? No, 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 I did not say that. You didn't need to. Guest Ranch was on a broad, level spot hacked out of the side of a mountain, part of the Rampart Range, about a half mile up from Highway 24. It consisted of about a dozen neat, modern, comfortable cabins, and from the front window of mine, I had a view of not only pikes, but several other peaks that hemmed in colorful Ute Pass. All very beautiful. Yes? Oh, hi. Dollar. My name's Lockerty. Taking you long enough to get here. Why haven't you been to see me? Well, uh... Well, I want one thing understood, Dollar, right from the beginning. When these relatives of mine get here... They haven't arrived yet? Well, I'm still alive, ain't I? Now, I don't want them to know what you're here for, you understand? Yes, but Mr. Lockerty... Now, uh... look, you look and listen. I invited them up to spend a week with me to try and make peace with them. After all, they're the only relatives I got. Uh, so I understand. And uh, to try to find out once and for all which one of them is out to get me. To get you? Why? 
Why? Because their father, just before he died, he made one of them promise to get even with me for, um, for, um, well, I, I, I sort of done him out of some money once. Your own brother, wasn't it? Yes, my own brother. What of it? What difference does that make? Well, how do you know about that promise? Because he told me before he died. Mm. And which one of the three do you suspect? Well, how should I know? I haven't even seen them, not for years. But now I've been getting letters telling me my time is about up. Threatening letters? Yes. I hope you've kept them. No, I haven't. But I'm worried. So that's the reason I've called them here for a showdown. I, I mean to, to, to patch it up or, or something. Mm -hmm. Oh. They... Here they are now. Wait a minute, Mr. Lockerty. Are you trying to tell me that that those three who just got out of that car... Yes. That one of them might be plotting to murder you? Yes, yes, yes. Ooh, somebody is crazy. Lockerty sneaked out the back door of my cabin. I stood there by the window and looked long and carefully at the new arrivals while they pulled their luggage out of the car there in front of the ranch office. And all I can tell you is that it was a pleasure. The one who'd been driving was 26 or 7, tall, blonde, and beautiful. Another, perhaps a couple of years younger, was a brunette, a real doll with a mischievous sparkle in her eyes. As for the third, well, I won't even try. Beyond saying that in spite of her heavy horn-rimmed glasses, a plain cotton dress, and hair done up in a bun, she was one of the loveliest, most naturally beautiful girls I've ever seen. So, as, uh, <clears throat> as casually as possible, I walked out of my cabin and sauntered over to them. Well, hello. We're here. I'm Kitty Lockerty. Oh, we all met in Colorado Springs, and Marion had her car, so that's why we all got here together. Well, hi. I, I'm Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought the manager's name was... Uh, what did you say it was, Thecla? Oh, Mr. Croy McClary or something. Who cares now? Hi, Johnny. Thecla? Mm-hmm. Like it? An unusual name. Oh, I'm an unusual girl, Johnny. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Paddle your own canoe, Thec. I saw him first. So what, darling? Mm -hmm. So you can just... Oh, now stop it, you two. Is the manager about Mr. Dollar? Uh, it's Johnny. Hmm? And I'm Marion. Marion Lockerty. Hi. And the answer is no. He drove into Manitou Springs right after I got here. But uh, if I can be of any help. Would you, Johnny? Cut it. I think we're supposed to have cabins 8, 9, and 10, Johnny. At least that's what Uncle Melvin said on the phone. Well, why don't we see if they're open? Here, let me grab some of this luggage. <laughs> Killers, hmm? Now, of course, you never can tell. After getting them settled in their respective cabins and calling attention to the square dance posted for that evening, I went back to my own cabin and simply waited, watching. A while later, the three of them got together and went over to Mr. Lockerty's cabin. Then, even with his door closed, I could hear him shouting at them. And finally, the girls went back to their own cabins separately and not speaking to each other. Then I dropped in on Lockerty. Crazy. Dollar, suppose one of them saw you come in here. What were all the fireworks about, Mr. Lockerty? I was nice to them, Dollar. I said I'd pay all the bills and give them anything they want up here. And then I told them. Yeah? I told them that I knew one of them was after me. And what'd they say to that? What do you think? They acted like they never heard of such a thing. But I knew better, Dollar. I knew better. I know that Harry, before he died, made one of them promise to kill me. Yes, but which one? Well, how should I know? I told you I don't know, but look at him. That peckler, the blonde one. Ah, quite a dish. He's all wrapped up in herself and nobody else. Don't care about nobody else. You think she wouldn't kill me? Huh? Because of promise and to get her share of the money in addition? Do you think she would? And so would Catherine. Kitty, that black-haired one. Hot-tempered little minx with those dark, shifty eyes. The way she tried to laugh it off when I said I was wise. Um, hmm. And uh, how about Marion, the one with the glasses? Yeah, sure. The quiet one, but smart. Just don't you forget that old saying, Dollar, that still waters run deep. Mm. Anyhow, I, I told him. You told him just exactly what, Mr. Lockerbie? That whichever one thinks she's going to kill me, she won't get away with it. So she'd better admit it, that's what. 
Don't you see, darling? I can't sleep. I can't rest. This, this, this thing is driving me crazy. That's the understatement of the week. No. What? 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 Look, if it's rest you want, Mr. Lockerty, I see by the bulletin board that there's a barn dance tonight, so at least you can get some sleep while that's going on. Uh, if they go to work... A... I'll try to see that they do. Uh, okay, but, but 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 don't you worry. Now, I'll be sleeping with a gun at my side. You carry a gun? I always do. No, well, no. if you ask me, Mr. Lockerty... Well, I... yeah, well, if I ask you what? <sighs> Nothing. Forget it. <laughs> my money, this selfish, twisted little old man was out of his mind, was far more dangerous than any of the girls. And yet, if one of them had made a promise to kill him, well, there was only one way to find out, or at least to try. I sashayed on over to the barn dance. The hoedown there in the barn that night was quite an affair. Far more than just the guest population of the ranch were there. And by lying mightily about my ability as a square dancer, I'd persuaded all three of the girls to be present. Then, although it took a bit of an eggling, Kitty and Thekla were having a high old time with some of the local boys. I managed to get them aside. Separately, of course, for a little walk in the clean, cool mountain air. I know, Johnny. I, I guess the whole ranch must have heard him ranting and raving at us, fair in his cabin. Why, Tessa? Oh, he has the silly notion that one of us promised to Daddy to kill him for something that happened once. But did you? One of you? Well, I know I didn't. But I'll tell you this, darling. That if I had, I would have done it. I mean, after what he did to Daddy. Oh, and what's he living for, anyhow? I mean, well, just think how nice it'll be when he leaves us all his nice money, hmm? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's getting chilly out here, darling. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, should we go back in and dance some more? Well, if you want to, but it might not seem so cold, Johnny, if, uh, Johnny... You know, come to think of it, I promised another fling with your sisters, too. Oh. Okay, Johnny. Okay, if you want to go back in, let's go back in. But later, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Better feel that with a kiss. Why not? Kitty was the next one I managed to get away from the dance. Well, it's the least that could happen to Uncle Melvin after what he did. You know, all I have to say is I wish somebody would get rid of that old coot. Well, why don't you do it then, Kitty? Well, then, don't talk like that, Johnny. You're talking about murder. Weren't you? Well, I know it may have sounded that way, but I, I didn't mean it. No, I hope not. What are we talking about him for, hmm? Such a beautiful night. With all the moonlight through the trees and... Hmm, Johnny? She would be kind of ashamed to waste it, now, wouldn't it? Hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of chilly, too, isn't it? <laughs> Boy, that's an old line. Well, then it must be a good one, huh? Johnny! I mean, if it works, and does it? Johnny! Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Are you, are you out there, Johnny? Oh, Mary, and you spoiled for it. You're like an old mother hen. Well, that's what you think. But Johnny promised to teach me the Texas star, and that's what they're going to dance next. You did promise, Johnny. Got to keep a promise, Kitty. Oh, Don. Maybe later, hmm? Yes. Mmm, Johnny. I never dreamed that a hard-boiled insurance investigator could Wait so. a minute now, Marion. What did you say? Oh, now, look, dear. Didn't you think I'd know the minute I heard your name? You I suppose that you're here because old Uncle Melvin has this ridiculous idea that one of us is going to kill him. Is it ridiculous, Marion? Well, don't you know why the three of us met in Denver and came here when he asked us to? Why? To humor him. So he wouldn't get silly and write us out of his insurance in his will. That's all. Can you see a pretty little secretary like Kitty committing a murder? Or a softy like Thecla who wouldn't hurt a fly? How about you, Marion? <laughs> Me? An old maid school teacher? <laughs> now, what do you think, Johnny? Well. Johnny, isn't it a shame to waste all this lovely moonlight? Oh, now, why couldn't I have had a teacher like you? <laughs> Uh, 
After the barn dance, the local folks went home and the ranch guests went back to their cabins. Except for Kitty and Thekla, who'd left me flat and paired off with a couple of boys with a fancy car. After delivering Marion to a cabin, I sat watching at the window of my own until her lights went out. Then I dropped in on Mr. Lockerty again. Yes, yes, I get plenty of sleep. But if you're going to bed now, Doro, I'm going to stay up. Now, look, Mr. Lockerty. I'm going to sit here and read the rest of the night. All right. Whatever you say, but Thekla and Kitty are out somewhere with a couple of boys, and Marion's going to bed, so if you ask me... Oh, she has, has she? Huh? What about the light that just went on again there in Marion's cabin? Hmm? Look. See it. Oh. Okay. All right, then I'll stick around until she goes to bed again, and the others come in. Well, look, uh, if you are going to sit here for the rest of the night, why don't I pull down this window shade? Yes, that's a good idea. Okay, here we are. Get down. Get down. That shot was just outside the window. Whether it was meant for you or for me, it... Mr. Lockerty. Mr. Lockerty. He's dead. The shot that killed Mr. Lockerty brought the ranch guests out of their cabins just as quickly as they could throw something out into their pajamas. Except for Kitty and Thekla and their boyfriends who were there within minutes. A short time later, Marion appeared in bathrobe and slippers. I had the ranch manager phone for the sheriff and then... Oh, Johnny, this is terrible, terrible. And in spite of the way I was talking tonight... Uh, Kitty. Well, I don't think it's so terrible. It's about time, I think. Thekla, that's no way to talk regardless of how we may have felt about Uncle Melvin. Kitty, Thekla, you two got here in quite a hurry. Where were you when it happened? Johnny... You don't think that either of us... No, 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 don't get emotional, Feck. And Johnny, Feck and I and Pete and Wally... Oh, excuse me, Johnny Dollar. This is Pete McKenzie and and Wally Thatcher. Hi, Mr. Dollar. Uh, well, didn't I see you four take off a while back? Yes. Yes, sir, we took the girls down the road for a beer after the dance. Yes, Johnny, we, we just got back and we're on our way to the cabins and we heard the shot. So we came over here instead. Yes, sir, that's just the way it was. I see. And aren't you going to ask about me, Johnny? What do I need to, Marion? No, no, Johnny, you don't. What's that, Kitty? As we came up the drive, we saw Marion's light go on there in her cabin. I couldn't sleep, Johnny, so I decided to make some cocoa and read a while. But before I could even... What's the matter, Johnny? Motive. Who else around here could possibly have a motive? But, Johnny, honey, surely you didn't think that one of us... I'm afraid I did, Thakla, but with... Pete and Wally with you two, and both Mr. Lockerty and I saw the light go on in your cabin, Marion. Wait a minute. There's another possibility. (laughs) Item three, 35 cents for a phone call to Colorado Springs to the one other person, the man who said he didn't care what happened to Lockerty. Yes, Dollar? Oh, then you are at home. Well, I've been home all evening. Why? Then you couldn't possibly have fired the shot and got all the way back there by now. Shot? What's that? Tell me, what's happened, Dollar? The sheriff and his men arrived, and I'll say this for them. They were very thorough. Also, they convinced me that disposal of the murder weapon could have been a cinch in a deep, mucky little pond in back of the row of cabins. By the time it was fished out, if it was there, fingerprints, if any, wouldn't mean a thing. And nobody, but nobody, was able to give any clue to the killer. A hunch? Okay. Maybe so. But one of those girls, one of them had recognized me. The only really clever one. The one who'd know the value of an airtight alibi. And she'd made a couple of points to me before it happened. Like their reason for coming. And she pointed a finger at the others while seemingly defending them. The only trouble was, darn it, that not only I, but others had seen that she was in her cabin when it happened. That she'd just turned on her light in there. We'd seen it. I'd seen it. Then I remembered. A little device that people use to protect their homes. So item four in Manitou Springs that morning, 11.25 for a gadget I hoped would turn the trick. 
Then that night, the girls and I sat together on the porch of the office unit. Uh, what did you say, Johnny? A check on your powers of observation, Thecla. I don't get it, Johnny. You will, Kitty. Now, look in through this window into the office. See the wall clock? Well, sure. Okay. Now, look over there at my cabin. I left the lights off, right? Well, yes, they're up in my cabin, too. All and... right, now, I'm going to leave you. And I want to know to the second what time I get inside my cabin and turn on the light in it. Sure, and then, Johnny? Then you'll see. Well, it's certainly taking Johnny long enough to get over there. Oh, just relax, Beck. I think he has something up his sleeve. If you want the truth, though, I can think of nicer things with Johnny than playing games. Well, it's right for you two. Oh, look, look, his lights are on, see? Okay, so he got there at exactly... Um, the time is exactly four and a quarter, four and a half minutes Don't after... Don't bother, Kitty, I'm right here. Johnny! Oh, just, Johnny, I... Well, just now saw so you turn on your lights way over there on your cabin. Well, you would have sworn that's where I was, wouldn't you? Well, of course. So would I, Johnny. The way you and the boys swore that Marion was in her cabin when your uncle was killed. But she wasn't. What? My lights went on over there just now because of a simple clockwork device that I put on the lamp cord earlier. An automatic switch? That's right. People use them to put on the lights in their homes while they're away and then turn them off in the mornings to make the house look occupied when they're not there. The way Marion made it look. Made it look as though she were in her cabin. Oh, John. Oh, no. Marion. That's right. Marion? But Johnny... Johnny, he didn't deserve to live. Maybe not, Marion. But nobody deserves to be murdered. Expense account total, including the trip home. Call it $400 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a case with a real switch to the finish. Tune in, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Fred Hendrickson. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Bill Smith, Edgar Staley, Freddie Chandler, Nettie Galen, Constant Simons, and Reynold Osborne. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto. Technical supervision by Mike Shostakis. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>